Good morning, everybody. Good morning, it's JPR, and welcome back to another video. If there's one thing I love about Pokemon, it's the abundance of crazy features that the game tries extremely hard to hide from you, even if they're actually really useful. One generation in particular that does this a lot is Gen 2. As a sequel, Gen 2 sought to add depth to many areas of Pokemon's gameplay, and one of those areas was friendship. Friendship used to be exclusive to just the starter Pikachu in Pokemon Yellow, but starting in Gold and Silver, all Pokemon now had a hidden friendship meter, which unfortunately led to friendship evolutions in the process, so that kinda sucks. But that aside, friendship came with a rather odd bonus feature in Pokemon Crystal only. If you level up your Pokemon in the area that it was originally caught or hatched in, then it will gain double the friendship it normally would, which certainly helps alleviate the grinding of some of those more annoying friendship evolutions. This is especially useful for the odd egg that you obtain in Crystal, since Pichu, Cleffa, and Igglybuff can all hatch from this egg, and all of them evolve with friendship. Though, personally, I would just reset the game until I got Elicator Magby, but to each their own. So make sure you hatch that egg on a really good grinding route, preferably one with a lot of trainer rematches through the Poke Gear. It will speed things up tremendously. What sucks about this, though, is that another Pokemon that evolves with friendship, Eevee, is only obtainable from Bill in Goldenrod City. So if you have rare candies on hand, make sure you only feed them to Eevee while you're in the city, or you'll be missing out on those big friendship gains. Otherwise, you won't be getting much outside of the Team Rocket Radio Tower takeover. And if you're ever unsure of where your Pokemon originated from, Crystal does include the Poke Seer in CN Wood City, an NPC who can tell you all the details of the Pokemon's origin, before her job got replaced by an upgraded status screen in Gen 3, which was probably for the best. While we're still on Gen 2, let's talk about another feature exclusive to Johto, Headbutting Trees. On paper, it's a pretty straightforward feature. Just headbutt a tree and maybe a Pokemon will drop down and start a battle. In reality, it's a lot more complicated than that. Only certain Pokemon are assigned to certain trees, some trees will never spawn a Pokemon, and some yield more Pokemon than others. And it all has to do with your trainer ID. There is literally a website called Headbutt Tree Calculator where you enter your trainer ID, plus your credit card information and the three little numbers in the back, definitely not sketchy, to get a full map of what trees fall into what category. But while that's all fine and dandy, it's not what I'm actually here to talk about. One of my absolute favorite details about this feature is how in Gen 2 only, depending on the time of day, Pokemon may start the battle asleep when they get headbutted out of the tree. At nighttime, diurnal Pokemon like Spearow will be asleep when you headbutt the tree, but during the daytime, nocturnal Pokemon like Hoot Hoot and Noctowl will be asleep if you knock them out of the tree. It's such a minor feature, but to me it just feels like it adds so much soul to the game. But sadly, this particular part of the headbutting trees feature didn't make a return in Heart Gold and Soul Silver, as wild Pokemon will always be awake regardless of the time of day. Honestly, Headbutt in general sticks out as one of the weirdest field moves in Pokemon history. I feel like they could have attached this feature to Strength, because making Headbutt into a single-use TM makes this move way more valuable than it has any right to be. But moving from weird moves to weird abilities, Gen 3 has a plethora of obscure ability effects. One of them we've discussed in this channel before, and that's how Hyper Cutter would increase the radius of the grass you could cut down in Pokemon Emerald. Yes, you used to be able to cut down tall grass in the first three gens as part of Game Freak's diabolical plot to involve more children in the landscaping industry. But this is far from the only ability with an obscure bonus effect. Some are pretty well known, like Flame Body, Magma Armor, and Steam Engine all cut down the amount of steps needed to hatch an egg. Or Suction Cups drastically increases your odds of reeling in a Pokemon while fishing. Many abilities also influence wild encounters, such as Static had a 50% chance to force an encounter with an Electric-type Pokemon, so long as there was one on that route. In Sword and Shield, many other abilities got this treatment. Storm Drain increases the chance of encountering water types, Harvest increases the chance of encountering grass types, and Flash Fire increases the chance of finding fire types. Galar Route 3 is one of the most effective places to test this, as you can catch a wild Growlithe or Vulpix with Flash Fire in the wild area, and then place it at the front of your party to make Sizzlipede's encounter rate jump from 1% to 50%. If you're Nuzlocking, knowing about these abilities that manipulate wild encounters is extremely useful information. But there are also abilities that do far more than just influence the type of Pokemon encountered. If your lead Pokemon has Compound Eyes as an ability, then it drastically increases the chances of wild Pokemon holding items, which can be very useful when it comes to finding rare evolution items that are held by wild Pokemon, like Magnemite holding Metal Coat, for example. In Sword and Shield, Super Luck also has the same effect. One ability that has a completely useless effect but I find kinda cool regardless is Swarm. You would think that it would function similarly to Static or Flash Fire, but it doesn't actually increase the spawns of bug types. Instead, in Pokemon Emerald only, it will increase the frequency of you hearing wild Pokemon cries in the overworld. This is such a silly inclusion, but I honestly kinda love it. 
Another ability effect with a similar level of obscurity in Gen 3, though, is the one that belongs to Lightning Rod. In Pokemon Emerald only, if your lead Pokemon has Lightning Rod, then it doubles the chances of trainers calling your Pokenav for a rematch, which is wildly useful when it comes to grinding in that game. So don't worry, fellas, if you're getting ghosted, just go get yourself an Electrite plush. She'll call back eventually. Maybe. One thing I never knew until researching this video is that apparently Sand Veil works even better for the player than it does for your Pokemon. In battle, Sand Veil increases your Pokemon's evasion by 30% in a Sandstorm. But if you have Sand Veil while walking a route with a Sandstorm, your odds of encountering a wild Pokemon are 50% lower. It shares this effect with Snow Cloak, which does the same thing on snowy routes. And Intimidate and Kenai, which lowers the encounter rate of all Pokemon as long as they're more than 5 levels below you. The most effective ability at decreasing wild spawns, though, is actually Infiltrator, which lowers wild encounter rates by 87.5%. The only downside is, it only does this in Sword and Shield, where wild encounters are already extremely avoidable compared to most Pokemon games. But I suppose it's helpful to know nonetheless. The saddest part of this whole thing is that Gen Age went extremely hard with these ability bonus effects, only for all of them to be removed in Gen 9 in favor of meal powers from the sandwiches. Sandwich making is fine and all, and honestly is probably more convenient for most players than relying on ability effects that the game never tells you about. But I actually like how my Pokemon can influence the game in more ways than one. So I really hope these ability bonus effects make a comeback in Gen 10. By the way, if you're finding any of these tips mildly useful, you can thank me by subscribing to the channel and helping us reach a quarter million subs. I'd really appreciate it. Speaking of other staples that Gen 9 randomly took out, did anybody else realize that Pokeruss is gone? Pokeruss certainly wasn't the most obscure feature ever made, as I bet most people watching know about it, but it was certainly one of the rarest. In fact, the odds of your Pokemon naturally contracting Pokeruss are about 1 in 22,000, which makes it about 5 times rarer than encountering a shiny Pokemon. But unlike most viruses, Pokeruss is actually quite helpful, as it doubles the EVs gained by your Pokemon in a battle. So maybe Game Freak thought, hey, competitive Pokemon is already easy enough to access in Scarlet and Violet with unlimited vitamins and auto-battling, so who needs this extra feature that makes it even easier? Yeah, right. Thanks, Game Freak. But regardless of the real reasoning, it's rather puzzling that a feature that had been in every game since Gen 2 is just suddenly gone. Which is strange considering that Pokeros' data is actually still programmed into the Gen 9 games. It just doesn't do anything. Legends Arceus actually had a similar situation where Pokeruss itself is not present in the games, but unlike Scarlet and Violet, if you transfer Pokemon with Pokeruss from Pokemon Home to Legends Arceus, it will still gain double the normal EVs. While this is a feature that we can certainly live without in modernized Pokemon games, it's still a bit disappointing to see it go, as it definitely served to add some more mystery and intrigue to the Pokemon world. Or you could just brag to your friends that you got Pokeruss when it's something that they've never even heard of. I don't know, it just makes the game feel more interesting, even when its purpose is largely gone. And since we're heading back to Kalos next year, why not end off with some rather odd Pokemon X and Y features? I feel like these titles introduce the largest amount of new features that we've seen, and while some, like Pokemon Ami, have evolved and become staples in the franchise, many others were left by the wayside. Roller Skate, Super Training, Horde Battles, Sky Battles, these are all pretty well-known ones, but there was another unique battle style introduced in these games that we've never seen again. Inverse Battles. Inverse battles are special battles created by the psychic trainer, Inver. What a creative name he has. Basically, Inver uses his psychic powers to invert type matchups. So fire types would finally beat water types just as Brock once prophesied. Admittedly, it's pretty fun, but these battles can only be done once per day and only against Inver, nobody else. At least until Omega Ruby and Alpha Sapphire, which included the option to let you do inverse battles in your own secret base. But if you're looking for a feature even more obscure than inverse battles, look no further than Natural Objects, a feature exclusive to Pokemon X and Y. In areas where they can appear, natural objects will show up in the background of wild battles and trainer battles, but only 10 to 20% of the time, depending on the rarity of the object. Basically, these objects are able to be broken during the battle and give you free items, but only by certain moves. And these moves also change based on the type of object in the background. For instance, berry trees can only be destroyed by Air Cutter, Blizzard, or Twister, but not Hurricane, oddly enough. Apparently, those winds aren't enough to knock an Orin Berry off a tree. Spiky rocks can only be destroyed with Hyper Voice or Rock Slide, but they do give you Evolution Stones, so it's definitely worth running one of these attacks in your Pokémon. And using Petal Blizzard or Razor Leaf on Tall Grass in the background will give you one of the three herbs commonly used in competitive battling. Once again, is this the most important feature of all time? 
Uh, not really, but it does add a level of detail to the world that makes it feel more alive. When I first discovered this in 2013, I thought for sure there would be a new mainstay feature, but surprisingly, it only lasted for one pair of games. So with that being said, can you think of any other obscure features that Game Freak randomly took out? I look forward to seeing your comments. But don't forget to leave a like on this video, subscribe for more videos just like this one, and I'll see you guys next time.